wonderful worship this morning. Would you take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the New Testament book of John, John chapter number 14. As you're turning there on this Father's Day, uh, I think it'd be appropriate, too, for us to give uh, all of our dads a little bit of love. Can we have a round of applause for the dads in the building today and those that are watching online? We'll praise the Lord for that. John chapter number 14, while you're turning there, uh, just, uh, you know, somebody, I had heard a little joke this morning, uh, one of our life groups, they said, uh, it's not been the case here, but in some churches, uh, you go to church on Mother's Day and dads get it beat up. You go to church on Father's Day and dads get beat up, all right? But we're not going to do that today. We're going to uh, look at this text in this series here on heaven, glory revealed that applies to all of us. Of course, we would say to um, every man in the house today, those that are watching online, <clears throat> that to be a real man of God, to be a believer, to be a man is to look uh, not to yourself, to have some sort of man cave or be the king of your own house and everybody serving you, but it'd be to take that crown off, throw it at the feet of Jesus and lead your family to pray and love Christ and serve them. That's what it means to be a real man, to be a real dad. And we look at this passage today, John chapter number 14, uh, read with me silently as I read the word of the living God for us out loud. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas spoke up and he said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How could we possibly know the way? And Jesus said, some of the most important words in all of the word of God, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. I like that poetic verse that says, some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory and break through the blue. Some golden daybreak for me and for you. And today in this text, we want to think just for a moment about what Jesus is saying here about uh, our home in heaven and that day where we will live eternally with him in that glorious place called heaven with streets of gold and gates of pearls, but ultimately where Jesus is. When we bring our attention to this text, you, you can't help but notice in verse number one how he says, uh, do not let your heart be troubled. Well, you know right away from the context that their heart was troubled. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and now, about three years prior to this, they had, uh, they had put all of their eggs in one bucket. They had said, Jesus is the rabbi. He is the teacher. He is the Messiah. He's the one promised from the Old Testament. He is God, very God, and, and so we're going to be all in on Jesus. But they were expecting for Jesus to establish the kingdom right then and there. That is, to break out the swords and wipe out the Roman Empire, establish the Christian rule all around the world. And that's not what Jesus said would happen. In fact, in chapter 13, their, their hopes are high, their expectations are large. And Jesus says, rather than uh, take over in a hostile way the Roman Empire, what I'm going to do is humble myself to the death, even the death of the cross, so the Apostle Paul would eventually say in the book of Philippians, and I'm going to go down those cobblestone streets of Jerusalem with a cross on my back, with myself bloodied beyond recognition. They're going to nail me to a cross, drop it in the socket of the earth, and I'm going to die naked for all the world, bearing the sin and shame of all the world in my own life, that they might have eternal life. And on this side of Calvary, we all say, amen, glory to God. But had you been a disciple in that day, you would have been scared to death for two reasons. One, no, nobody, nobody wants a king. Nobody wants a leader who's going to a cross to die a cruel death. And on top of that, 
if that's what they're going to do to your leader, what are they going to do to you? And so when we get to the end of chapter number 13, you'll find that all of the disciples are nervous and they're sad. And in fact, the apostle Peter is trying to turn this thing around. No, 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 you don't understand. You you can't die. You've got to live. You've got to rule. And all the way up until the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter is getting it wrong. He ends up cutting the pulling his sword out, cutting the ear off of Malchus, and Jesus puts it back. He says, That's not the way we're going. It's the way to the crown is through the cross. The way to glory is through the grave. The way to righteousness is through being made right by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And now we pick up in these verses, and let me just point out three things here in the verses in the time that we have today. Would you look at verse number one, and maybe we could say something like this, learn to calm your heart. Learn to calm your heart. You may be here today with anxieties and fears and being overwhelmed and feeling like the world is caving in on you. You may look to your media outlets and news outlets and our society and country right now feels like there's just an earthquake among people and you're unsure and oh my goodness, what's going to happen this year? And you may have a lot of fear and trouble in your own heart. But notice in verse number one, There are actually three commands in this one verse. Do not let your hearts or let not your heart be troubled. It's actually an imperative. It means this is something that I want you to do. It's not, you don't get to sit back and relax or it's not just a passive thing. Well, you know, I won't worry or I won't fear if if something happens. No, the idea here is that in the Christian life, we will continually move forward toward Jesus. And we will wake up every morning and we'll say, I will not let fear get the best of me. Perfect love casts out fear. And on the cross, Jesus demonstrated perfect love for you and for me. And so when I wake up tomorrow, no matter what is going on in your life, you've got to decide to say, I will not fear. Because Jesus is in my life, I am on the winning side. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, you have to preach the gospel to yourself before you have your first cup of coffee in the morning. And for some of us, that's really tough. Amen? Or maybe while you're having your cup of coffee tomorrow morning, you just speak the gospel over your life that Jesus has died on the cross and rose again, that your sins are washed away, that you have a new home in heaven and a new heart and a new family and a new life to live and that you will not be overcome with fear. Let not your heart be troubled. I will choose today to live in the victory of Christ. Tell yourself that over and over and over. Fake it till you make it. Amen? Okay, that's not in the Bible. You don't have to say amen to that. (laughs) Can I say to you sometimes, sometimes when you're not doing well, sometimes when, as I used to say, when you're lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut, Sometimes you just have to speak the word of God and the truth of Scripture over your heart again and again and again and allow the Spirit of God to take the word of God to move inside of your own heart and to breathe that new life in you. And slowly, the confidence, not in some statement and not in your own ability, but the confidence in what Jesus has done for you and who he is will give you new life. Now, notice in verse number one that the calming of the heart is an active process. Let not, don't, do not let your heart be troubled. He'll repeat this again later on in the same chapter in verse number 23. Don't let your heart be troubled. But then notice the other two commands. It says, here's believe in God. Some of your translations may say, you believe in God. Yes, believe also in me. But don't, don't run past that. We'll get to Christ. But he's saying here, you believe in God. Believe in God. Those who will see eternal life, so the book of Hebrews says, must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And most of us in here, we want to run to that part and say, we have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But listen, the Bible is plain and simple. Just start by believing that God exists. 
It'll do you really good to tell yourself that tomorrow when you get in the car and you start to face traffic in Atlanta. Because the way some of you drive, I get questionable sometimes. Preach to yourself, I believe in God. Do you know why we sang this song a little while ago? It runs back all the way to the Apostle Creed, Apostles' Creed. We do believe in God. We do believe in Jesus Christ. We do believe in the Holy Spirit. One God manifested in three persons. We believe in God the Father Almighty. Part of the commands run together. Notice this. Don't let your heart be troubled, but it's not just some sort of, I'm going to calm my heart by picking myself up by those bootstraps or by doing some sort of Eastern meditation. Oh. Listen, you can do up dog positions until you are up chucking, and none of that's going to help you. No. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because we believe in God. And you look around at the world outside and you see the things that are going on. You remember that God does exist. And the Bible teaches that one day he will make all things right. I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday. Oh, man, I'm chasing rabbit trails today. Well, that's all right. We'll get to it next week. I was talking to a friend yesterday and we were talking about songs. And there is a good part of Christian songs where... A lot of them are about, hey, man, I'm, I'm going through trials and tribulation, but thank God he loves me. Thank God he's there for me. And it is, it is kind of centered on our experience. And you know what? Some of that's okay because you experience life and the Christian life, and God comes in from beyond to, to help us in the needy and the nitty-gritty of our own existence and our own experience. So there's a good thing about those songs. But don't ever forget, too, there are good things, just as we've sung today, where we speak about the very nature of God and exalt Him, that He is invisible and immortal and God only wise. And sometimes when life leaves you perplexed and wondering and in chaos and you can't quite figure out the end from the beginning, all that's left is for you to raise your eyes and heart to God and to say, I believe that you exist and that you're there, that you're benevolent and wonderful and glorious and magnificent. And I, though I cannot see the end from the beginning, will put my trust in you. That's the way to calm your heart. Notice the last part of verse number one. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Yes, it ends with believe also in me. Do you see the bookend in this section? You remember I told you before, almost every book of the Bible is written with these bookends. Something real strong at the beginning, something real strong at the end, and those particular themes are fleshed out in the middle of the book. In verse 1 and verse number 6, there is this beautiful harmony between the Father and the Son. Believe in God, believe also in me. What does Jesus say in verse number 6? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to who? The Father. But by me, in verse number one, it is the intertwining work between the Father and the Son. Believe in God, believe in me, Jesus said. And in verse number six, he is saying, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to that Father but through me. My dear friends, sometimes people will say, I, I want to hear the voice of God, then read the Bible out loud. I want to know God, then look to Jesus. I want to see God, then look to Jesus. I want to know the character of God, then look to Jesus. Do you know something? Listen, I, I, I read a statistic or heard a statistic this last week from Malcolm Yarnell out of, uh, out of Southwestern in, in Texas that LifeWay's recent research said 79% of evangelicals that go to church twice a week Believe that God, that Jesus is God, but that he's a created being. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. He came into the world and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of mankind and was humbled even to the death of the cross. He took on humanity, but he was God, very God, long before he was ever born in Bethlehem. The second person of the Trinity has always existed. Everything that it means to be God 
eternality, sovereignty, omnipotence, omnipresence, everything that it means to be God, the Son possesses now and in eternity past and for all eternity in the future. We must get the sonship of God correct. If you want to know God, look to Jesus and no further. Well, verse number one, those three things. Listen, if you want to calm your heart, you have to be actively working at it, that you're going to preach the gospel to yourself. Secondly, you must believe in God of the Bible, and you must believe in Jesus Christ. Now move quickly to verse number two. We have this, uh, we have this homecoming one day. And notice he says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. Let me take just a moment to say this. What he's saying here is he, he is speaking of two things, but one, he's speaking about heaven. He's saying, in my father's house, all right, in heaven, there are many mansions. Now, now listen, I grew up with an older brother, and everywhere we moved when I was growing up, because he was the older brother, he always got the first choice of the room. Fast forward, I'm 45, I got two boys, and guess what? We bought a house with two rooms for them that are the exact same measurements. <laughs> All my youngest in here need to rise up and say glory to Jesus. <laughs> but I used to think about this passage, well, listen, he's getting the larger room. Well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to build me a big mansion. I'm going to ask Jesus for like 15 rooms and seven bathrooms. Some of you in here today, you can go home, look at your kitchen, and say, I would love to have these cabinets refaced in heaven. That is not what this is talking about. You, you will not need a brick and mortar building in heaven. In fact, this same language is used by the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians when he says, Look, in this life now, we are clothed upon with these same word, dwelling places, these tents. But there, we will receive our resurrected body as a mansion. Really, when it says dwelling places, it's, it's rooms. And so I want you to think about it like this. When, we, when you get to heaven, it's not like you, you're going to, like if you were really good, you get a mansion on the, over, you know, over on a lake and all that kind of choose your neighbors. Or, and if you weren't so good, you, you, your mansion's a little smaller and all that. No, no, what this is talking about is just simply this. There's room in the Father's house for you. If you're listening online, if you're watching, if you're right here with us today, you've never come to the place in your life where you have repented, turned from your sin, and said, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, please save me. I have no other help. I, I have no other hope. I need you to save me. If you've never thrown yourself on the mercy of Jesus Christ, right now before this service is over, call out to Jesus in your mind and ask him to save you, and you'll have a new home, a new room in heaven. There's room at the cross for you. And there's room in glory for you. But I also would just point out to you that in this text, in verse number 2, it's speaking about something in the past, and it's also speaking about something in the future. So now there is a future home in heaven for us, and we will have many rooms or mansions. Listen, I grew up singing. I got a mansion just over the hilltop. If you like that, keep on singing it, all right? But I'm just telling you, there will be room in the Father's house for all of those that put their faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. But did you know that if you did a little bit more digging on this, you'd find that in verse number 2 where it says, In my Father's house, that earlier in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus comes out of the temple, and the Pharisees, they say, This is the Father's house, speaking of the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus says to those bunch of yahoos, Guess what? You can tear it down, and in three days, I'll build it back again. <gasps> what are you talking about? It took 40 years to build this temple. It's the holiest place in all the world. And, and, and they were so blinded by their own sin and pride that they didn't realize that what Jesus was saying is, yeah, that temple may have been at one time the Father's house, but you can tear me down at the cross, and on the third day, I will raise up again from the grave. And I will be the Father's house for all of those who run to me. What's really going on in this text is Jesus saying, In my Father's house, I am the Father's house. 
That's the reason some 96 times in the New Testament you will find this language, in Christ, in Him. We spoke a few weeks ago about Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the world. And he says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and when Christ is revealed in glory, we will be revealed in him. Yes, there's a beautiful home in heaven for us. Yes, there'll be no more pain and no more heartache and no more disease. and There'll, there'll be all glory. But I, I never want you to lose sight of the fact that the foretaste of heaven is a life right now in Jesus Christ. And the longer that you grow into that thought of being with him and in him, protected by him, loved by him, living for him, you will be prepared for heaven. Isn't it interesting that in the New Testament there are these massive truths that are contained in just a few short words. For instance, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. All of the work of your salvation, all of the work in those three words, it is finished. What about this? When the ladies uh, come, to the, come to the grave and they say, uh, where is he? And he says, he's not here. Why? He is finished risen and everything that was affected at calvary everything that was accomplished on the cross is vindicated by the resurrection of jesus christ now we come to john chapter number 14 and he says and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again my dear friends i, I want you to know that jesus is coming back one day all of our suffering, all of our struggle, it'll all be done away with. Jesus will condemn all that is wrong, and he will establish all that is right. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter number 21, that the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven. Don't be looking for some sort of square or pyramid building. It just simply means that God in Christ will make this world his dwelling place for us and that all the nations that are in Christ will run like the streams to him. Look with me, if you would, uh, at these two verses quickly. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Aren't you glad that Jesus is honest? If it were not so, I'd have told you. Now notice the repetition here. I go to prepare a place for you. In verse number three, notice the if-then clause. If I go and prepare this place, then I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. You ever think about that? What, what, what's the idea about rep the repetition of I'm going to prepare a place for you? I mean, you see what I'm saying? Jesus is, I promise you, Jesus does not have like a long neck hammer and some 16 penny nails and putting up drywall somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus, he's not, he's not building some buildings, no. Maybe you should think about it like this. Do you think that Jesus finished his work on Calvary and then rose from the dead and now he's just kind of like kicked back in a lazy boy in heaven with a Diet Coke and a, you know, moon pie? <laughs> Can tell what's on my mind. <laughs> no. Did you know that Jesus is doing his heavenly high priestly work every day of your life? Part of him preparing room and a place for us is that every day of your life from now until the day that you die, he is communicating with the Father and the Spirit on behalf of you. Every time you fail, every time you come short, every time you sin, he is praying for us and interceding for us and helping us through his prayers and the prayers of the Holy Spirit. They are preparing a place for us. Look with me, if you would, there at the end of the verse. Uh, well, I'll just move. Look at uh, verse number four. He says, and you know the way. You know the way where I'm going. Now, notice how that word way there is repeated three times. Verse four, you know the way. Verse number five, Thomas ends by saying, how do we know the way? And then verse number uh, six, Jesus says, I am the way. 
Verse number six, he says here, Jesus says, I am the way. Did you know that in the early church, in the book of Acts, actually, you'll find it a number of times, but the early Christians uh, were known in the first centuries as people of the way. They would capitalize it. And what they meant by that is that uh, Jesus is the way. Jesus doesn't say in verse number six, I'll tell you about the way. I'll open up a map and show you where X uh, marks the spot and tell you how to get there. No, Jesus said, it's me. I'm the way. Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you want to be my disciples, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and follow me. Christianity is all about following Jesus. I want you to understand today, dear friends, that Jesus would have never understood salvation without discipleship. There is a misnomer sometimes that people can get saved and then 15 years down the road, I think I'll decide to follow Jesus. No, to be saved is to decide to follow Jesus. And the initiation in that is to say, my first decision is to realize I can't save myself. But I believe that he died on the cross and rose again. And I will accept him. I will trust him as my Lord and Savior. And I will follow him all the days of my life. Y'all heard that song recently, Lead On, Good Shepherd. I think we're going to be singing that before too long. Is Jesus the good shepherd of your life? Have you trusted him? Have you laid down everything and come to him and say, I want you as the Lord and Savior of my life, and I'll follow you. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by That statement is not popular in the world in which we live. Is it exclusive? Yes. It's by nature exclusive. There are not many roads to heaven. There are not many religions that will take you to heaven. There is only one person, and his name is Jesus. Can I say to you today, I want you to make Jesus the way and the truth and the life that you live. There is coming a day when he will take us to his own, the place prepared for us, beauty and wonder and glory and majesty. It will be fantastic. Until Jesus comes, calm your heart by preaching the gospel to yourself, believing in God, following Jesus, and living in his presence every day. Would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just a minute, we'll sing a stanza or two of the song. This is just an opportunity for you to reflect right now on the truth that's been preached to you from the Word of God. We've sung it. We've prayed about it. We've heard about it from the Word. Jesus Christ is Lord. My dear friend, if you're here today or watching online and you've never trusted Jesus, make this the good, glad day in your life where you just stop fighting, lay down all of your weapons of pride and brokenness and all of that and just come to Jesus and say please Jesus save me and I'll follow you all the days of my life would you make that decision right where you are maybe for other believers in the room today hey I, I've met so, so many believers that say I'm homesick for heaven I believe that Jesus is coming soon but you know the vast majority of people that tell me I believe Jesus is coming soon They haven't invited anybody to come to church in the last 20 years. If you believe that one day Jesus is coming to break through the blue for me and for you, would you decide right where you are that this week you'll go out and pray that God would give you an opportunity to invite somebody to come hear the gospel, to share your testimony, or to give them the gospel plainly right where they are. I know, I know we're creeping into the summertime, but may our hearts always burn because Jesus is coming again. Let us tell the world. Would you stand with us? Let's sing just for a moment. Altars are open. There's pastors on either side of me. You can come and pray. Somebody will pray with you. Let's sing just for a moment.